Hello and welcome to Agri History. In this episode, we will talk about the domestication of wheat. But before we begin, we must define a few terms to make it easier for everybody to follow. First, we must define sulfane. Sulfane is a process used to produce self pollinate cultivars of various plants. The process usually happens in plants where individual plants can pollinate their own flowers rather than receive pollen from another plant. The simplest example of how this process works in the production of cultivars is Step 1. Plants are crossbred and the seeds are collected. Step 2. The best seedling, in terms of what the breeder is looking for, is selected from these seedlings. This seedling is allowed to self-pollinate and produce brand new seeds. Of those seeds, the seedlings that are identical to the parent are kept while the outliers are removed. This process is repeated six times, allowing for the creation of a plant lineage with 97% genetic purity. This is how wheat, soy, most grains, and the majority of heirloom seeds are made. Next, we must talk about grain anatomy. This will be useful for future grain videos. First, we'll talk about the spikelet. The spikelet is the grain equivalent of a flower stem. Next, we'll talk about a floret. A floret or the grain flowers. Next, we'll talk about the rachis. The rachis is the axis that the florets are attached to. Next, we'll talk about the rachella. This is the axis where the spikelets are attached to. Now that we've covered all that, let's get into the grains themselves. Starting off with wheat. The origin and evolution of wheat began 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent. Early farming practices made use of wild diploid wheat species such as members of the Aegilops and Triticum genus. However, as agriculture evolved and changed, wild crops were gradually replaced with domesticated diploid and polyploid wheat variety. In our modern era, Hexaploid bread wheat dominates global wheat production. This type of wheat is derived from free diploid species in the tribe Triticae. These species include Triticum rato, Aegilops spetsloides, and Aegilops tauchi. These are respectively known as the A type, the B type, and the D type. The first step to the formation of wheat was likely the crossbreeding of the a type and the B type. This resulted in the tetraploid grain species we know as Emmer. This species then hybridized with the D type to create the hexaploid species we know as wheat. Based on current evidence, Emmer wheat is likely to have originated within the past few hundred thousand years, whereas our current wheat came into being with modern agriculture 10,000 years ago. The origin of hexaploid wheat is currently supported entirely by archaeological evidence and the absence of wild hexaploid wheat in wild populations. Although the relatedness of the free genomes found in bread wheat has been well documented, the phylogenetic history and divergence of these free lineages is still limited. The earliest cultivated forms of wheat were essentially land races selected by farmers from wild populations. This would have been due to superior yield and other agronomic traits. This would have been a very early form of plant breeding. The earliest of these cultivated forms were likely einkorn, a cultivated form of the A species, and emmer the tetraploid form of the hybrid between the A and the B species. Domestication of wheat species came in association with other domestication traits, such as the loss of the shattering spike at maturity and the change from a hold form to a naked form. In terms of grain, the non-shattering trait 
is the result of a mutation in the BR genetic region. The naked forms arose by a dominant mutation within the Q genetic region, which affected recessive mutations within the TG genetic region. All the cultivated forms of diploid, tetraploid, and hexaploid wheat species all have a tough rachis, with the exception of spelt wheat. Similarly, the early forms of wheat, einkorn, emmer, and spelt, were all hulled, while modern forms of hexaploid and tetraploid wheat are free threshing. This makes sense because einkorn and emmer were developed early on from domestication of natural pop populations, while bread wheat only existed in cultivation, with origins in accidental crossbreeding between emmer and a wild goat grass, also known as Triticum tauchi. This hybridization probably occurred several times independently with the novel hexaploid varieties being selected by farmers for its superior properties. Red Fife is Canada's oldest wheat, and is of legendary status. The old tale of how we got Red Fife is that a large amount of wheat was grown to Ukraine and was about to be shipped off in the Glasgow Harbour. A friend of Farmer Fife collected some of the red coloured wheat and shipped it off to Farmer Fife. Farmer Fife grew that wheat, but when the wheat grew, the family cow managed to eat all the wheat heads except for one, which Miss Fife salvaged. According to legend, this is how Red Fife began in Canada. Red Fife was gradually replaced as new and improved varieties of wheat were made to combat the new fungal diseases and pests that came onto the fields. However, most of our bread wheats in Canada can be traced back to the lineage of Red Fife. Synthetic hexaploid wheat, or SHW, is an artificially created hexaploid wheat that was bred for the purpose of obtaining new and better agronomic traits from the tetraploid and diploid ancestors slash relatives of our common wheat. Most synthetic SHW lines were bred by crossbreeding durum wheat with goat grass. In most cases, the diploid species is used as the pollen source. The goat grass pollen is then used to pollinate durum wheat. The reverse of this crossbreeding is possible but unwise due to the smaller embryo and the embryo defects that happen. Embryos derived from these interspecific crosses may develop, but endosperms may not. To that end, it is necessary to conduct embryo rescue two to three weeks after pollination. Due to the lack of the endosperm for the embryo to feed on, embryo rescue is a process where plant embryos are removed from immature seeds and grown using tissue culture. The plants made through tissue culture are triploid and as such are tree of culture seed to double their chromosome number before they're transplanted into soil in pots. This allows for seed production so that the synthetic wheat strain can be perpetuated. There is also work to try to skip the embryo rescue process. This is achieved using different strains of durum wheat or any related tetraploid. Different strains have different levels of endosperm production. Like for example, Langdon 
is well known for high endosperm production. The first attempt at making synthetic weed was done in the middle of the last century with synthetic spelta. A study was done to determine the progenitors of spelta. Since the late 1980s, the organization CIMMYT has bred more than 1,000 SHW lines. Subsequent studies have found that the SHWs are a valuable genetic resource with better performance under biotic and abiotic stresses, as well as higher yield potential. The synthetic weed itself, however, cannot be used as a cultivar due to the presence of wild traits, such as halt grain. To remove these traits, they have crossbred SHWs with domesticated wheat to breed synthetic derivative lines, also known as SDLs, using superior wheat cultivars for crossbreeding with SHWs. Many beneficial SDLs have been bred. 2003, Spain created a patent on a synthetic wheat derivative called Carmona, and at the same time, China also released his first SDL. Since then, at least 62 varieties of SDL have been used as cultivars around the world. And these SDLs show a significant increase in genetic diversity when compared with their parents. There are many traits found in synthetic wheat inherited from the different ancestors. Some of these traits are found in goat grass, which include drought, heat, and salt tolerance, as well as disease resistance to carnal bunt, stripe rust, yellow leaf spot, and powdery mildew. Durham wheat ancestor also provides some carnal bunt and stripe rust resistance. Synthetic wheat also contains the ability to bioaccumulate micronutrients like zinc and iron, making them useful in areas where food sources with those nutrients are scarce. Synthetic wheat also has superior phosphorus uptake efficiency. These traits make it useful as a breeding parent for wheat. This concludes our video on wheat. Stay tuned for the next episode which covers rye and oats. See you then!